Good morning, everyone. Welcome to World Water Day. Welcome to H2 Awesome Waterways. As we present this morning, we're going to be toggling between some screens and some presenters. Um, so be patient. This will be uh, as uh, glitch free as possible. But we know with technology, there's always some some surprises. So my name is uh, Peter Glapp. I'm a teacher with Wellington Catholic District School Board. And we'd like to start today with, uh, with just a, a space to focus. So I'd like you to take a look at the image of your, on your screen. What elements do you see? Perhaps you notice the stone the reflection of the clouds, the dispersal of leaves and needles. All of this is suspended in water. I found this space last week near, near the city of Ottawa, and it directed my thoughts to the core elements of our planet. Light reflecting images off the lake, land protruding in the form of rock, leaves from trees, wind with the clouds moving above and the leaves being blown away from branches and water frozen liquid vapor it is water that binds all of these elements together and it binds us together as well we learn play and live on the traditional territory of the of the Ottawandaronk, mississaugas of the credit river six nations of the grand river and the Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation. We acknowledge their presence on this land and say thank you for enduring the arrival of newcomers hundreds of years ago and newcomers to this day. We acknowledge their wisdom, the ways they received from and gave back to the land. These are qualities we all need to develop within ourselves, our community, our planet. As we work towards our own reconciliation, may we genuinely seek to uphold these values to help guide how we interact and bind with light, land, wind, and water. With this spirit of gratitude, I would like to turn it over to Henry from Holy Rosary Catholic School to introduce our first guest to H2 Awesome, Waterways. Good morning and welcome students and teachers from the Upper Grand District School Board, from Wellington Catholic and the Environmental Services personnel from the City of Guelph, and to Julia Barnes, who is giving our first H2 Awesome presentation this morning. My name is Henry Moran. I'm a grade eight student at Holy Rosary School. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Julia Barnes. Julia has spent over a decade working to bring about change in the treatment of our oceans through her filmmaking. She is the director of a documentary entitled Sea of Life. She is dedicated to educating people regarding our human-caused environmental threats facing life on this planet and has been working tirelessly to bring about positive change. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And we're going to launch into the presentation. All right. So yeah, thanks everybody for listening to my presentation today. I'm really excited to be talking to you about the ocean some big issues that are happening there and how I've used filmmaking as a form of activism. And I'm really happy that this event is taking place because water 
is obviously the thing that gives us all life. And it's something that we need to be thinking so much more about and taking so much more action about, um, but it's often kind of relegated to the back of our minds. So it's fantastic that H2Awesome is bringing it to the forefront again. Um, the ocean is the largest water ecosystem on our planet. It is this great circulatory system of our planet. It regulates the flow of nutrients, heat and cold. It regulates water pa weather patterns and the climate. And it does all of these things that make the planet habitable for us and other species. Every time we breathe, we're connected to the ocean. Two out of every three breaths we take come from plant life in the ocean. Tiny little microscopic organisms called phytoplankton produce most of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. But they're also in trouble. They've been wiped out. Their populations are down 40%. So it's really important right now that we're paying attention to water issues, that we're paying attention to what's happening in the ocean and doing something about it. And that's all part of the reason that I ended up making a documentary about the ocean and what's happening there. So I'm gonna tell you lots more about how I ended up on this journey of filmmaking and some of the things I learned along the way. Um, but to start off, I'm gonna share with you a little trailer for the movie. The moment you enter the water, you become a sea creature. A whole other world opens up in front of you where you can do anything and fear nothing. This is the biggest, most important ecosystem on the planet, and it's in trouble. The basic chemistry of our oceans changing faster than it has ever changed in the history of the planet. We see very, very interesting one over here. 100 million shocks a year killed by humans. There will not be any fish by 2048 to do what we're doing right now. It's ecological insanity. We're bringing on a mass extinction in the oceans, and that's something that will change everything in the planet. It's a crime, not just of the century, but the crime of all time. Without the oceans, we literally will die. I set out to make a movie because I believe that if people knew what was going on, they'd do something about it. Big changes do happen all the time, and they don't happen because governments decide the right things. They happen because people create that change. This is our task. You know, it's not about are you going to be a doctor or a lawyer or a secretary, but how are you going to change the world? When everything you love and everything you depend on is in jeopardy, Action is no longer an option. It is a necessity. We will be the ones that will be suffering from what the governments are not doing today. It's not future generations, but it's us right now. So I started making that movie when I was 16 years old. I was a high school student, and I had just watched a documentary by Rob Stewart called Revolution. And in it, I learned that the world's coral reefs, the rainforests, and fish populations are predicted to be wiped out by the middle of the century if current trends of exploitation, habitat destruction, and extraction continue. And as a kid who was totally in love with life on our planet, I couldn't believe this was happening. And I became very inspired and energized to want to do something about it. I wanted to do something right away because the issues were so urgent and I just couldn't know that this was going on, know that this was the future we're heading towards within my lifetime and go back to my regular life and act as if everything was okay. So I took about a week after watching that film to think about what I could do that would actually make an impact. And I ended up deciding on making a documentary and particularly making a documentary about the ocean. Because I went back to my regular life and it seemed like everyone around me didn't really know that much or cared that much about environmental issues. And the ocean in particular was something that was so far 
out of sight and out of mind. People just weren't thinking about it, did not know what was going on there. So I thought if I could make a film and if I could bring this to people's attention and having had that experience of watching a documentary and becoming totally inspired to want to do something about the issues that were covered in that film, I had personally experienced the power of documentaries to engage our emotions and to inspire people to want to get involved. So I thought this would be a, a good and useful thing to do. And I had this very naive idea because I had never made a documentary before, right? I picked up a couple of cameras. I signed up for scuba diving lessons. I was like, right, I'm going to go out and make a film about the ocean. How hard can it be? And I had this very naive idea that I would finish a documentary, a feature length documentary in two months, essentially. So I went down to uh, Florida to film coral reefs and do my first dives in the ocean and to interview a couple of scientists who were specialists on corals. And one of the things that I learned um, after that whole experience was that making a documentary was gonna take a lot longer than I initially imagined. I came back from, from doing this filming expedition with nowhere near enough footage to fill a 90 minute documentary. Um, but as I was looking through the things that I had shot, I realized I made every mistake you could possibly make as a filmmaker. I shot footage that was blurry and out of focus and shaky. I filmed an entire interview with the microphone turned off. And so I realized that making a film was going to involve maybe a lot steeper of a learning curve than I initially imagined. Um, but I was so committed to the process. I had said, I'm going to make a documentary about the oceans, and I was committed to doing it. So it was just going to take more time, more practice, more interviews, because every time I talked to a new person, it would open up so many more questions and really expand the scope of the film. So I started practicing. I would take my camera with me everywhere I went on nature walks and I would just film everything and then look at the footage and figure out what I needed to do differently. And I kept interviewing people. I, so Sea of Life ended up taking three years to make, a lot longer than I initially thought. It took me to seven different countries all around the world and I interviewed over 50 different ocean experts. So scientists and explorers and conservationists and ocean activists. And I got a real education about what's happening to the planet. And one of the things that was really important for me to cover in this film that ended up becoming a big issue in the film is what's happening to coral reefs. Coral reefs are really key to the health of the ocean. They are home to 25 to 30% of all species in the ocean at some stage in their life cycle. So they hold this incredible chunk of life in the ocean, despite the fact that they cover less than 1% of the sea floor. So they are very biodiverse. They're actually the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet coral reefs. And corals are really amazing organisms in and of themselves. They're kind of like a combination of plants and animals. The coral itself is an animal, but it has tiny plants called zooxanthellae that live inside its tissue, tiny algae. And these algae photosynthesize and create nutrients that the corals need to survive. So they have a symbiotic relationship. They share those nutrients with the coral. The coral provides protection for the algae and they work together. And when you're on a coral reef, when you actually dive into a coral reef and spend time in this environment, you are just surrounded by so much life, so much density and so much diversity of life. You see all sorts of species, including some of the big charismatic species that we think about in the ocean, like sharks and stingrays and eels and sea turtles. You also see all sorts of varieties of fish from the tiniest little ones who sometimes have really big personalities, um, you know, all the way ranging in size and color and shape. And you see so many different interactions between species. There's things called cleaning stations, which I actually got to watch happening where 
little fish or shrimp will clean the parasites off of other fish and the fish kind of queue up in a line and they wait to have this happen. So they help each other. The different species are interacting with each other all the time. And when you go into a coral reef ecosystem, you kind of become a part of that environment for the time that you're there. It welcomes you in and you're interacting with all of these species and every time you move, life reacts. And so it's very much this incredible experience to be on a living coral reef. Um, but around the world, corals are vanishing. They're being wiped out. When I started making Sea of Life, already 50% of the world's coral reefs were gone. And there are a lot of different factors contributing to the loss of corals, right? Even something as seemingly trivial as like people wearing sunscreen when they go to the beach, the chemicals get into the water and they can negatively affect coral reefs. If a piece of plastic is touching a coral, that coral becomes much more susceptible to diseases than it would be if that plastic wasn't touching it. So plastic does something really negative to a coral's immune system. Um, there's also the direct destruction of habitat, the removal of fish. If, if a reef is overfished, if a lot of the fish population is taken out, that reef tends to be less healthy because you just see a kind of deterioration of all of those relationships that help to keep the coral reef um, functional. But one of the big issues facing coral reefs that's much larger and more overarching is, the, is being caused by the pollution of carbon dioxide that we put up into the atmosphere. So I'm guessing that everybody listening to this presentation is quite aware and understands the impact of carbon dioxide on our atmosphere, the impact of climate change. But something that a lot of people maybe don't know about is that a significant amount of the carbon dioxide that we put up into the atmosphere doesn't just stay in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed by the ocean. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it actually makes the water more acidic. In an environment, in more acidic environment, organisms that build shells and skeletons have a much harder time forming. And at a certain point, they just can't form at all. So this is called ocean acidification, and it's having a big impact on coral reefs. And I'm going to play a little video for you, some excerpts from the film um, about this issue. There's a place in Papua New Guinea where carbon dioxide is bubbling out of the sea floor from natural volcanic vents. The CO2 mixes with water, causing this part of the ocean to become more acidic. It's like a time machine that allows us to look into the future to see what will happen to coral reefs if ocean acidification continues. Corals can't survive in this more acidic water. They're dissolving and turning to rubble, and there aren't many fish living on them. Coral reefs have been described as a canary in the coal mine. When they aren't happy, it's a sign that something is very wrong in the ocean. Our planet has been through five mass extinctions in the last 500 million years, and through all of these, Corals have been the first to go down. Although they cover less than 1% of the sea floor, coral reefs are home to 25 to 30% of all species in the ocean. They are the most biologically diverse natural communities on the planet. Much of the carbon dioxide that has been released since the Industrial Revolution has been absorbed into the ocean. When carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it makes the ocean more acidic. In a more acidic environment, animals who build shells and skeletons can't form. The ocean is 30% more acidic than it was before the Industrial Revolution. It is acidifying faster than in mass extinctions of the past. 
If this continues, coral reefs could literally start dissolving. 50% of the world's coral reefs are already gone, and scientists are predicting that all the world's corals could be wiped out by mid-century. But the effects of ocean acidification go far beyond coral reefs. Ocean acidification affects fish and their ability to smell and build skeletons. It also affects plankton. Plankton form the base of the oceanic food web. They produce the oxygen in two out of every three breaths we take. 40% of the plankton population has already been destroyed due to a combination of ocean warming and acidification. We are losing them at a rate of about 1% per year. There's a lag in the time it takes the ocean to absorb the carbon that has been emitted into the atmosphere. So even if carbon dioxide emissions went to zero today, it would take 20 or 30 years to equalize with the ocean for the ocean to continue becoming more acidic. In order to address these problems, we not only have to cut emissions, but pull carbon out of the atmosphere before it gets absorbed into the ocean. Forests, prairies, seagrass beds, mangroves, and many other natural communities sequester carbon. Many of them have been decimated and could pull large amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere if they were allowed to regrow. Fish sequester carbon in their bodies and excrete gut rocks, which help balance the acidity of the ocean. 90% of the large fish have already been wiped out. There's a tremendous potential to sequester carbon by letting fish populations recover. Cabo Pomo in Mexico is a great example of the potential of fish populations to rebound. Within 10 years of being declared a marine protected area, the amount of life in the ocean increased by over 450%. Fish went from being heavily depleted to thriving again. So ocean acidification is a really big deal for coral reefs, but something that is impacting corals even faster and more immediately is the direct heating of the ocean. So the ocean has absorbed 90%, more than 90% of the excess heat caused by climate change. So whatever warming we're experiencing on land and in our atmosphere, which you know we're very much already feeling the effects of that, it's happening 10 times faster in the ocean, 10 times more intense. Um, so we're already seeing the effects of this in really big ways, like it's changing the migration patterns of fish, it is affecting the distribution of species, but corals can't just pick up and move when the water becomes too hot for them. They are stuck exactly where they are. And they also have only a certain temperature range that they can tolerate. So if the water becomes too hot for too long, corals get really stressed. And something that they tend to do when they're stressed is to release the symbiotic algae living inside their tissue. That algae is what gives them their color. So when they release that, uh, they turn white. So that's why this whole phenomenon is called coral bleaching. You can see straight through to their skeleton. And without those algae, if they don't have them for too long, corals can't survive. So something that happened, um, you know, as I was filming Sea of Life, I was talking to a lot of coral scientists and they were like predicting um, that we were gonna have a mass bleaching event sometime in the near future. And towards the end of making that film, um, there was a mass bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. So there's actually a scene in the movie um, that shows the, this mass bleaching event. And it's kind of a really powerful moment. It's like everything has changed on the reef. Everything has gone white. There's even anemones that are white. And um, we're you know, witnessing this kind of unprecedented event. Uh, but what happened after Sea of Life came out is then there were a couple more mass bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. And recently, I think it was last summer, 
there was a mass bleaching where all of the corals bleached in Florida. So these events are happening so much uh, faster. These are things that, you know, never used to occur in, in you know, recent history. So, um, yeah, this is, this is something that's impacting reefs uh, very much more quickly. Um, so I'm going to show you a short little video about that. 93% of the excess heat from greenhouse gas emissions has been absorbed by the ocean. Ocean warming is contributing to the diminishment of plankton populations and changing the migration patterns of fish, forcing them to travel further to reach colder water. But the most visible sign of a warming ocean is the effect it has on coral reefs. Corals are animals who have a symbiotic relationship with plants. Tiny plants called zooxanthellae live inside their tissue. This is what gives corals their color. The plants photosynthesize and produce nutrients that the coral needs to survive. In return, the coral provides a home and protection from predators because most species don't like eating coral. They work together. As corals grow, they strive for sunlight so that the zooxanthellae can photosynthesize better. Corals build skeletons out of calcium carbonate, and these skeletons create structures that become home for many other species. Corals are key to the health of the ocean, but healthy corals are becoming harder to find. One of the biggest threats to corals is ocean warming. Corals have a temperature range that they can tolerate, but if the water becomes too hot for too long, the coral gets stressed and releases its symbiotic algae. Without the algae, corals turn white, revealing their skeletons. If the temperature returns to normal within a short period of time, the coral may be able to take back some algae and recover. But if the water is too hot for too long, the coral simply can't survive. Since 1993, the rate of ocean warming has more than doubled. Mass bleaching events are becoming more frequent and more severe. So another thing that was really important for me to cover in the film is the direct removal of life from the ocean. And what I learned is that large fish in the ocean, so things like sailfish, tuna, mahi-mahi, sharks, any kind of big fish you can think of, on average, have been depleted by 90%. So their populations have gone from you know, what they should be to 10% of, of what they used to be in a relatively short period of time. And that's because of the impact of industrial fisheries on the ocean. Of course, there is no surplus in nature. Everything in nature exists for a reason. Every species has a role to play in its environment, in its community. And so when you remove huge chunks of the life in the ocean, it's going to have really deleterious effects and kind of ripple effects that spread through the entire ocean. And the kinds of fishing that is being done today, yeah, I don't even know if it can be called fishing anymore. It's kind of this theft of life from the ocean. It is using technology and using methods that are just wiping life out of the sea so much faster than they can reproduce. And it's the removal of nutrients without giving anything back. Because when you think about it, if a fish eats another fish within the ocean, all of those nutrients are staying in the ocean. They're gonna be excreted in the larger fish's excrement. They're gonna to go towards feeding another fish who eats that fish, um, or they're gonna remain in that fish's body. But when humans extract fish from the sea, we bring them onto land and they, the nutrients don't make it back to the sea. So we've had this huge diminishment of the biomass, the mass of life in the ocean. It is so much less than what it should be. And so you have things uh, like bottom trawlers that, uh, you know, one of the most horrific forms of fishing that are taking place today where this massive net is dragged through the ocean and catches just about everything in its path. 
and even dragging along the bottom of the ocean. So it's scooping out the habitat so that even if a fish manages to escape the net, it's not going to have a home to go back to. And a lot of the fishing methods, uh, purse seining, uh, long lining as well, a whole bunch, um, they're incredibly wasteful. So it's estimated that every year about 54 billion pounds of fish is caught, brought out of the ocean, and thrown back as waste because they weren't the target species. So these kind of indiscriminate fishing methods, they can catch anything from just smaller fish and species of fish that the company isn't interested in selling, making a profit off of. They can also catch sharks and sea turtles, even sea birds and mammals like dolphins and sea lions. And so we have this, I mean, there's also like sonar now, a lot of fishing companies use sonar to locate the fish. So the fish really can't hide. Like we can figure out exactly where they are, go in with a massive net and scoop them out. So we have this diminishment of life in the ocean, which is really problematic. We're seeing the collapse of a lot of fisheries today. And it's just being done at a rate that is completely unsustainable and completely out of touch with what the ocean can handle. And, you know, the film looks at all of these kind of horrific things that are taking place in the ocean. And I think it's really important that we all understand that. I mean, one of the statistics in the movie is like, it's estimated that 200 species go extinct every day. Or I shouldn't say go extinct, they're being driven extinct, they're being wiped out. And we're very much bringing on a mass extinction in the ocean. Um, and this is all, you know, very horrifying and very important that we know that it's happening so that we can care and want to do something about it. But for me in the film, it was important that, you know, most of the footage in the documentary is not seeing this horrific stuff take place. Most of it is actually seeing the beauty of the ocean, not to create this illusion that the oceans are all okay and totally fine, which is what a lot of environmental documentaries tend to do nowadays but to make people fall in love with the ocean, to see species that you've maybe never seen before, to see interactions between species, symbiotic relationships, or maybe some relationships that are not so symbiotic, but to see and to connect with the ocean, to make people care about the ocean. Because people, as much as you can understand logically what's happening, you really have to care about the ocean and love the ocean and fall in love with the species who live there if you really want to be motivated to protect it. So uh, for me, one of the coolest moments in the making of the film was getting to meet and swim with my favorite species of shark in the ocean, the great hammerhead shark. And I used this footage at the beginning and end of the film to kind of signify and tie in the human connection with the ocean and also this idea of fighting for what you love. Um, Great hammerheads are my favorite species in the world. They're one of the rarest types of hammerheads. They're highly endangered. Um, they're also the largest species of hammerhead in the ocean. They can grow to be 20 feet long. And they have really cool personalities. They're kind of shy and curious at the same time. So sometimes they'll come and check you out and other times if you move the wrong way, you can totally scare them and they'll swim away from you as fast as they possibly can. So it was really cool for me to interact with great hammerhead sharks. And, and one of the key points that I wanted to get through in the movie is like um, bringing life back to the planet is a big part of what we need to be doing because we should be doing that anyway. All of these species, all of these ecosystems, communities in nature have the right to exist. They should be thriving. They should not be under this intense pressure from us. Um, but also what we get when we bring back ecosystems on land and in the ocean, when we bring life back to this planet, is we get all of the kind of carbon sequestering benefits that come with functioning ecosystems. Um, so yeah, that was something, something that I wanted to focus on. And so after three years of making this documentary, it was finally ready to release and um, you know, when I started making this film as a 16 year old kid who knew nothing about filmmaking, 
a lot of people kind of thought I was crazy to be doing this. And I was in a way, um, but I was so committed to the process that I was going to figure it out, that I was going to make the best environmental documentary that I could, no matter how much time or kind of building up of skills I had to do to get there. And so finally this film was ready to release and it ended up screening in more than 50 film festivals around the world. It was picked up by Crave in Canada. It started, uh, it won 11 awards and it started screening in different um, environmental organizations, libraries, schools, universities, and it became this great platform to be able to talk about what was happening in the ocean. And I got to go to a whole bunch of different schools in Ontario and give presentations and screen the movie and talk about what was going on. And uh, every time I would screen Sea of Life, I would have people, you know, get really excited about these issues. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, I want to get involved. I want to do something. I'm going to do something to help the ocean. I would have people say that, you know, previously they had not thought they wanted anything to do with it, but after watching my film, they were going to go into ocean conservation. So it was pretty incredible for me to see the power that film could have, the way that films can engage people's emotions, make them care about issues. Um, and a couple of years after Sea of Life came out, I found out about a new issue that was happening in the ocean. It wasn't really new, but it was new to me. It was something I had never heard of before. It was called deep sea mining. I found out that companies are targeting an area of the ocean 4,000 meters deep in international waters, and they're hoping to extract metals from the ocean through mining. These mining companies have framed it as if the deep sea is a desert. It's a lifeless desert, nothing lives there. Don't worry, we're not gonna hurt anything. Um, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The deep sea, and particularly the area that they are targeting, is full of life and the most amazing, incredible species you can imagine. The very things that they are looking to extract from the ocean, these rock-like formations called polymetallic nodules, are actually key habitat. They're the only hard substrate that organisms can attach to and grow from, like, for example, corals or sponges. Corals in the deep sea can get to be 4,000 years old. Things in the deep sea have incredible lifespan because everything is much colder and metabolisms are slower down there. Sponges can get to be 11,000 years old. Can you imagine living for 11,000 years? What would you have seen? What kind of wisdom would you have? And these are the things that these mining machines are going to be bulldozing as they go and try and extract things from the ocean. They're tar targeting these rock-like formations because they contain trace amounts of nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. Things that are used in potentially batteries for electric cars, but they also have military applications. And these companies are willing to sell them to whoever's willing to buy them. Um, but recent studies have shown that 50% uh, of life in this region of the deep sea depends on these polymetallic nodules. So they're key habitat. They're not going to come back on any kind of human time scale. This is a diagram of potentially what deep sea mining could look like in a list of likely outcomes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, one of the main things that scientists are really concerned about is the release of sediment flumes, wastewater, um, which gets into the gills of fish if a fish swims through them and is trying to breathe. It um, inhales these fine particulate matter and those get stuck in their gills and clog them up, damage their ability to breathe and can suffocate them. And these stay suspended for months at a time and currents take them very far in the ocean. Um, species extinction is considered a likely outcome of deep sea mining. And these are some of the areas that companies are looking to mine. So the one that's circled is the one that's being targeted right now, circled with that dotted line. It's called the Clarion Clipperton Zone. But anything in blue, yellow, or orange could potentially come under threat from deep sea mining. So huge swaths of the ocean. So I wanted to do something about this issue, try and stop it from happening. And um, this was also during the height of the pandemic and 
traveling wasn't really an option. So I tried to think and challenge myself and figure out, could I put together a documentary essentially without leaving the house? And so I started interviewing people all over the world through Zoom and kind of cobbled together this documentary with footage that was freely available online or given to me by friends and, you know, kind of at the loss of quality, but still being enough to get the point across. I paired the short documentary with a petition on the issue, the petition linked to the documentary, the documentary linked to the petition so that people could learn more. And the petition ended up getting a little under 25,000 signatures. It was aimed at Canada, asking them to support a moratorium position on deep sea mining. And Canada did end up coming out with a position supporting a moratorium on deep sea mining. So kind of a victory in a way, but their position is also very weak and basically says that if there's strong regulations, maybe we would support deep sea mining. Um, so definitely there's still a lot of work to do there. I'm going to show you a very short excerpt from the film so you can kind of get a sense of what it looks like, but if you want to watch the full thing, it's available on YouTube. The ocean has sustained generation of Pacific people. Mining it would be like mining one tool, breaking up one tool. Deep sea mining has not been consulted. It's not wanted in the Pacific, and we're calling for a global ban. If all the projects that are being proposed in the Clarion Pacific Zone go ahead, that will actually be the largest contiguous mining area on Earth. The cumulative impacts of many mines is a, a huge concern. There's migratory grounds, different species through this area. There'll be noise, there'll be light, there'll be the, the turbulence and the disturbance of the ocean floor. There's so many different elements that we have to be really concerned about. Our oceans are so under threat in so many ways. Why would we be wanting to create a whole new industry where we don't even really know how severe the impacts would be? But we do know they're going to be severe and they're going to be long lasting. If there was ever a future problem that we can stop now, it's this. We don't need to be too mind. We shouldn't be doing it. Let's stop it before it happens. That would be that would be a genuine win for humanity. It would be a win on a par with saving the Amazon. So deep sea mining is still an issue that is relatively unknown. A lot of people aren't even aware that it's happening, and we really need way more people fighting on this issue to try and stop it from happening. Um, because it hasn't gone through yet. There's no commercial scale deep sea mines in international waters, but it's something that is very much imminent and could happen essentially any moment. Right now, there are 25 countries supporting a banned precautionary pause or moratorium at the international level, with the governing body on this issue. There are 167 countries plus the EU that are members of that governing body. So there's still a long way to go and a lot of work to do. We're gonna get Tippett anyway in the favor of not having deep sea mining happen. Um, so obviously there are so many threats to the ocean right now. And there's also so many opportunities to get involved and do something meaningful to try and tackle some of these issues. And this is something that I think you can really take any skill set that you have or skill that you want to learn and apply it to these issues, right? Whether it's organizing and doing direct action or writing or doing art or making films, um, there's just so many ways that you can get involved and so much meaningful work to be done. So I hope that some of you who are listening are going to join me in this endeavor and this adventure of bringing life back to this planet. We absolutely need way more people dedicating their lives to this or even dedicating a significant chunk of their time and thinking about and caring about and acting on ocean issues and water issues in general. So thanks so much for listening to my presentation. And yeah, now's a good time, I think, to go into Q&A. Thank you, Julia. I could, I could ask my own questions here, but let's let's hear from the students. Uh, there are a number that uh, that came up, and some some uh, residual questions on top of questions. So we'll see uh, we'll see what our time looks like, and we'll 
we'll pick our way through them. So you're going to see them at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Right there. So grade seven and eight at uh, PPS ask, what are some ways that we can stop releasing so much carbon into the atmosphere and environment? I think probably the best place to start would be eliminating unnecessary consumption, right? So much of the carbon that is being burned is being burned for kind of frivolous things. Um, so anything like we have this kind of economy that's built around producing cheap consumer goods, often made out of plastic, which is petrochemical products, shipping them around the world to factories to be built, shipping them to us where we might buy them and use them for a few months or a year and then throw them away. So we have this very wasteful, extractive um, kind of economy that's built around um, burning fossil fuels at every stage of the production process. So I think, you know, so much of the conversation around um, CO2 emissions tends to be focused on individuals, our lifestyles, our household use, of which, you know, we can be thinking about all of those things and reducing them, and that's great. But really, the largest consumers and the largest emitters are industry. They're industrial. So anything we can do to kind of I mean, ultimately, the thing that I think is going to reduce emissions is going to be kind of targeted direct action efforts and things that really get in the way of the ability of these industries to keep extracting and keep burning um, carbon dioxide, fossil fuels. But, um, you know, what we do in our individual lives, we should be looking at and changing as much as we can. But kind of this, this, this shift in focus towards what we do in our individual lives is really um, serves the industry in a way. It kind of benefits. It's like, you know, the plastics industry kind of made everything be about recycling. We've got to recycle more. Um, but of course, that's just a way that they can shift the onus off of themselves and put it onto regular people. Um, and there's, it, it takes a lot more. There, there's, we got to think about levers because the issues that, that we're working on are so urgent. Um, we got to think about things that we can do that are going to have the maximum amount of impact. So for example, with fisheries, it's like if I stop eating fish as an individual, that's, you know, I have done that because I know about the impacts of, of industrial fishing on the ocean and I don't want to support that. But that's not going to make a dent in the profits of these fishing companies. But if I'm lobbying to try and have subsidies not go to industrial fisheries, like right now, Fisheries are being subsidized to the tune of, oh, it's, it's in the billions, like 30 billion, something like that. I don't remember the exact number per year. And that is tax dollars directly funding the overfishing, the destructive fishing of our ocean. So you think that's like a much bigger lever that would actually have a huge impact. And there are people that are lobbying, and petitioning and trying to do things to take that away from the fishing industry. So I think we need to yeah, be thinking very strategically about the way that we target um, all of these issues and think of ourselves not just as consumers, not just as individuals, but as citizens and as people who have voices and can take action and have a lot more power than just what we buy or don't buy, things like that. Thank you. Uh, here's a follow-up. Describe what it felt like to dive with ocean life sharks, the great hammerhead shark, and see different ecosystems and environments under the water. I love that question about what did it feel like for you? Yeah, I like that question too. It was amazing. I mean, when I did my first dive in the ocean, I was terrified. Like I did not like the idea of scuba diving, of being dependent on this air tank. And I was really scared of drowning. Um, so my heart was racing when I jumped into the water in, on a coral reef for the first time. But as soon as I took a few breaths and looked around me at all of the life, I like became completely calm. And I just like, it's almost like my brain turned off and I was just experiencing this totally novel experience of being surrounded by like undescribable beauty. And yeah, it felt amazing. It kind of feels like when you enter the ocean, you become a part of it, you become a sea creature in a way and you can interact with the world in such a different way than you generally do on land. Um, you know, when you walk into a forest, usually we make a bunch of noise and we, 
kind of scare a lot of the life away. But when you're in the ocean, a lot of species will come right up to you and they'll, you know, say something to you in a way. And yeah, that's, it's, it's so different being in the ocean. It's amazing. And another follow-up, did these experiences make you even more passionate about educating others about saving ecosystems, in particular ocean ecosystems? Definitely. I fell in love with the ocean when I went into it. Every time that I would have an experience diving, it made me so much more um, committed to wanting to fight for the ocean and wanting to protect it. How long does it take for the coral, uh, a coral reef to revive? So after a bleaching event, if the coral does survive, I think it takes on average about 10 years. So this is something that a lot of the scientists were telling me when I was asking them questions about coral bleaching. Basically, if coral bleaching happens at intervals of more than 10 years apart, like coral bleaches in 2024 and then it bleaches again in 2034, then corals can survive and they can kind of bounce back from that. Um, but if coral bleaching is happening at a, a, a rate, any time, any interval smaller than that, then they can't, they can't really survive in the long term. There's a follow-up question about um, what type of acts we can, we can, we can do. And, and you, you've made mention to individual personal choices that we make, rethinking our choices, rethinking the way that we live. And you also mentioned, uh, that uh, activating our voice, our, our civil voice in, in activating government action. So this next question deals with that. Mm -hmm. What is a way that we can contact over global governments to make an impact on deep sea mining? Mm, good question. So they all have email addresses and you can definitely write to them or yeah, there's, some, there's usually maybe not directly the person um, well, see if you can find the email or the mailing address of the person who's a representative to the International Seabed Authority. That is uh, the regulatory body on deep sea mining. Um, but otherwise, there'll be departments that deal with this kind of thing. So yeah, you can try and make your voice heard there. Also, you can. there's lots of petitions on this issue that you can sign. Um, there's a really good one by some people in the Pacific. It's called the Pacific Blue Line Statement. So I would definitely encourage you to check that out and see to what extent you can support and get involved in that. Those are Pacific Islanders calling for a global ban on deep sea mining. And we'll take it to the last two questions now, Julia. So I uh, want to know whether whether you were met with resistance or obstacles to creating this documentary and how you overcame them? Mm. Yeah, good question. Lots of obstacles for sure. I mean, just the fact that I was starting out, um, that I didn't have experience in filmmaking. A lot of people, you know, as I was telling people that I'm making a documentary, they're like, oh, there's lots of funding for documentaries, right? You can, you can just get that, apply for that. And one of the things that I realized when I started looking into, you know, making this film is that everything kind of required that you either had a degree in filmmaking, you had already produced one or two films before, or you had like a network or broadcaster involved. Um, so I had to, I did the whole thing out of pocket. Um, I had to learn everything kind of on my own. Um, I did connect with some really good filmmakers who were mentors to me and kind of showed me how to use the camera. Um, but a lot of it was trial and error, and there was a lot of error. And so every aspect of making the film was a challenge. Um, but yeah, it was something that I was just so determined to do that I really wasn't going to let anything stop me from doing it. And what made you interested in all this? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I can really pinpoint it to one specific moment. In a way, it was watching a documentary called Revolution which was made by Rob Stewart. Um, yeah, that movie completely inspired me and changed my life. But I think leading up to that, the thing that made me kind of predisposed to caring about this, these issues is, was spending time in nature and having those direct experiences. Like I would go to a local frog pond and you know, I, as a kid, I was always chasing insects and reptiles and 
and yeah, falling in love with the natural world and exploring it. Um, and I think that's, uh, I, I love how you just framed that last bit, just going to explore whether it's a, looking at frogs in the pond. And I think when we, we want it, we want to do, we want to do good. We want to change, change the trajectory. We all do, but, uh, and to get there, we have to build a relationship. We have to get to know our spaces, whether they're underwater or above water, even just going out the door of our, of our schools, we are floating on a rock, third rock from the sun in space. And it's amazing. It is absolutely our world. Our planet is an amazing space. And when I, when I see the images that you share, I get this feeling of wonder and awe. And then I think, well, I'm not going to jump in the ocean today, but I'm going to go outside and I'm going to look for this wonder and awe. And once we start seeing it and acknowledging it, then that the comments at the beginning with, of, of receiving and giving back to our planet, I think those, those feelings come about. And that's how we'll start to move forward in a great way and things will change. And uh, the innovation, you, know, you, you made reference to this industry and governments that need to change. The people sitting in the seats right now, you are going to be our, our next innovators. You are going to be the ones that come up with new ways of going forward, rethinking how we do, we interact with our planet, with, with other species and be a lot more symbiotic, um, learning lessons from the coral, I think, which would be, uh, would be a great lesson for all of us to learn. Julia, thank you so much. I, I, was, I was just uh, honored to be part of this and thank you for taking us up on our offer to present to our, to our schools. Uh, we had 20, 20 viewing live, which uh, you know, that could be over 300 people that were watching this morning. Um, so thank you, really appreciate it. And for those uh, whose colleagues were not uh, able to hop on live, we, we will have a recording to, to share with you. We're also gonna be sharing the, the link to watching the video, the, the movie, it's not a video, it's a movie, Sea of Life. And we'll be sharing that out with you uh, shortly. And some of you have already received some, some uh, provocations uh, regarding our presenters. Uh, for those who have not, those will be coming out again as well. And just to remind you that next week, we don't have any presenters. This is World, World Water Day. So uh, give thanks to the water that we have in our life, on our day that's within us. And next week, we will, we will take a little hiatus from presenting. And we're, we're back on April the 3rd with Mylene Piquette, who is from Quebec. And uh, although Julia was exploring underneath the water, Maylin explored above the water in a rowboat from Canada across the Atlantic. And so her story of adventure will be pretty neat to, uh, to listen to and, and kind of what teachings that she has for us about water. Uh, Julia, thanks again, your courage to overcome those obstacles and to go underwater, as scary as those moments were, uh, your courage, uh, your passion, and your your um, charge for us to do something. I feel that, I feel that deeply, that uh, you've kind of nudged us all, poked us all to say, hey, let's, uh, let's be part of the solution in a good way. Thank you, thanks. thanks again. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you on the 3rd, April the 3rd. Take good care.